We're going to talk about... Alright, cue the intro, blah, blah, blah. We're going to talk about my Dungeons & Dragons group. Now, I'm in a Dungeons & Dragons group. Surprise, surprise. It's one of the first clubs I joined on camp. Actually, that's not true. But it was like the first club meeting that I attended is the Dungeons & Dragons club. So anyways, I went to the Dungeons & Dragons club... And the first thing I did is, you know, they had a listing up on like a Friday night. They said, Friday night, come to this room in this building. And we're going to, if you want to be part of the Dungeons & Dragons Club, there we go. So, bam, I'm inside of this one room. Everyone's filing in. I just pick a seat and I sit down. It's this huge lecture hall. Like, um, think stereotypical lecture hall, you know, with the one professor with the one table and the whiteboard. And then they got like concentric rows of, you know, like benches surrounding. That's the type of building I walk into. So anyways, I go, I go in that building. I take a seat down and a bunch of people will start coming in. And uh, first of all, let's take a quick side detour and let's talk about girls. Okay. Because girls, this is a uh, yikes. So anyways, every once in a while, they'll be like, a, you know, I... I find most women attractive. Um, you know, every once in a while there's, uh, you know, oh, don't, yikes, don't want to look at that anymore. But most girls I'm attracted to. And, but every now and then, I'd say like one out of 50 girls that I see, no, like, yeah, maybe one out of 50. One out of 50 girls that I see just had, no, it, it's got to be like one out of 70. Yeah, that seems like a fair metric. One out of 70 girls that I see just have that air of something about them. Like they hold up. <coughs> <coughs> thank you. I know you said bless you, so thank you for that. But as I was saying, like one out of 70 girls, they just have something about them, you know. They just, there's something about them. You know, it's, maybe it's the way they walk, probably the way they look. Um, and it's not even that they're like conventionally attractive like they're not wearing like high heels and walking or drowning like mini skirts those are hot but like ask any guy there's like there's there's a difference between like hot and like actual like I don't know there's a there's a something there you know like guy, guys will basically fuck anything I mean there's some people out there who like fuck pineapples and stuff but you know, there's hot, and then there's, like, marriage material. So, how does this all relate back to D&D? &D? Well, I'll tell you. So, I walked into the Dungeons & Dragons Hall, and I sit down, and I'm just kind of reading the room. I don't really want to go on my phone and just, like, fade into the background. I kind of want to, like, look around, know what's up, because, you know, it's college, and everything's new, and this is my first club meeting. I want to see what's going around. So, I do that. I just start looking around, and in walks this girl. And she's, I can tell she's somewhat shy. And actually, fun detour story, my dad was 100% convinced that everyone in the Dungeons & Dragons group, everyone in the Dungeons & Dragons room would be like unattractive male guys. Like that old stereotype of like, um, shit, like ugly board game enthusiasts who like are straight virgins and everyone's in the room is like over 40 and... Anyways, he was convinced about that. But it was actually a good mix of uh, boys and girls. Um, but anyways, in walks this girl. I don't even know her name. And she had, I've never seen her since. But she walked in. I remember she had a black and red sort of like Harley Quinn style uh, face mask. Uh, she had brown hair. She had glasses. Um, and she was, she was alone. She wasn't like talking with anyone. She didn't walk in with a friend group. It was just her. And uh, she walked in, and she and she sat like two rows behind me. Um, and you know, I I'm not like a creepy sort of guy to like, you know, leer at her and stuff. But I'm also not I'm not within the incel mindset of oh you should date the gentleman like me and not go for the chads or whatever incel terminology they like to use. I'm sort of like a live and let live sort of person i'd be like yeah if you like her go talk to her be like no i'm not talking to her i'm a fucking coward i don't want to embarrass myself i can't even get friends let alone a girlfriend so um yeah quick roast on me but anyways 
So in walks this girl. She sits around three around rows behind you. To describe her, she had like brown hair. She had glasses. Probably weighed like 130 pounds, if I could say. You know, small girl. Um, not super tiny, but small. You know, she's a small girl. She's not like... Anyways, moving on from that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, she just walked in. She had that air about her. And I was just like, man. Just, I went... <sighs> Like, I want to get to know you better and stuff. But anyways, that has absolutely nothing to do with Dungeons & Dragons. So, that was just a giant rant about this one girl who walked into Dungeons & Dragons. Fun fact, the way they assign the Dungeons & Dragons group is... So, we're all in this hall, right? Everyone who saw the poster said, Yeah, let's show up at Dungeons & Dragons. All the presidents, the vice presidents, treasurers, and the, like, advisor all introduce themselves. Hi, my name's blah, blah, blah. I'm gonna be, you know, I steal your money. And so... Anyways, we all got together. We all got together. And they were like, okay, so the way we're going to do this is we have dungeon masters. The dungeon masters run the game. These are all the dungeon masters. And, you know, there's like 12 people. They all wave hello. Um, and so, like, now, each of these dungeon masters is willing to accept a certain amount of players. Here's some raffle tickets. And then they handed out raffle tickets. They actually gave it to us um, when we walked in the door. But ha that hasn't been relevant until now. So we got raffle tickets. And they say, each of these raffle tickets has a pairing. All right? One pair, one half of the pair that you have and the other half is in this bucket. I'm going to reach in, grab a random raffle ticket, and pull it out. And then you'll be able to choose which dungeon master you want. And so I was like, oh, that's cool. But then I started looking around. There's like fucking 100 people here in this room. And there's only like 12 dungeon masters. And each of those 12 only accept 5. So let's do the math really quick. 12 times 5 is equal to 60. So that means like 40 people are not going to be able to get one of these dungeon masters. So I start thinking, oh, shit, man. I might like shoot. I might not even get to be a regular dungeon master. And uh, so anyways, they're like, okay, so the way this works is we're going to pull out a raffle ticket. We're going to call uh, raffles. And uh, if you have the raffle ticket, stand up, say the name of the person you want to join, and then you'll be in that group. And But before we do that, you have to know what you're picking. So we're going to introduce you to all of the dungeon masters and the types of games they're running. Basically, it's just a short, for like non-Dungeons & Dragons people, including myself, they're just giving a short pitch about what their world is about and be like, do you want to play in this world? So anyways, they go through that, and I ended up picking this guy named Douglas, and... But I ended up going with this other... Um, and his story, it was kind of... In between the Renaissance and Industrial Era. So you got like flintlock pistols. That sort of era. Um, <laughs> and so anyways. Um, there was that. And I ended up going with him. And uh, and you may be like. Well what. D how'd you get him? I mean there was like 60 people who get the spot but 40 people who don't yeah well i was like the third one called <laughs> they were like oh this one come on i picked this oh another person i picked this and then harrison be like yep that's me i'm going with douglas because douglas's world seemed cool um i was actually considering picking another guy but i got put on the spot and i just chose him be like douglas i'm over you but i don't regret it all the people there seemed fun um, but anyways, yeah, so now I'm in this Dungeons and Dragons group. We got Kaden, Kellen, Tristan, Mahe, and me. And there was another girl called, uh, like, I don't know, like Hannah or something. Uh, she ended up dropping out because something, something, her schedule. But, yep, that's the point where we're at in the Dungeons and Dragons. And so we all got to creating our character. We got set up with all the spells. I ended up going with an Order Cleric. And we all start off at level 5. So we got like some... We got cool shit out the gate. Um, in Dungeons and Dragons terms. Um, but anyways, we start at level 5. Uh, the whole point is that there's like 5, you know, super mega bosses scattered around the lands. And we gotta go defeat them. And the first one we decide to try and beat is the Corruption. And that's where we're at, we're at right now. I think we're only on our like third session. Uh, next week is gonna be the fourth session. But how does this... Um, this is just like the intro into 
how I got into Dungeons and Dragons in the first place. What I really want to talk about is I want to dungeon master. I want I want to be the dungeon master next time and be like Harrison. Isn't that quick to say you haven't even done Dungeons and Dragons until like a month ago? Yeah, well you're right. But I got a lot of artistic ideas that I want to make a reality. And um, you know I got a I got a what's it called? I got like a map set up already. I got like somewhat of a lore cobbled together. Um, it's a real like passion project for me. But the problem is that I get. I get like these passion projects that last like a week and then um and then I never do them again. And that's not just me, that's like a lot of people, but it's like I'm afraid this will happen here is like I'll spend 20 hours this week designing like everything, getting the lore down, and then and then like a week later I'll lose motivation and then it'll just like slowly sink into like my past Google Docs and I'll just forget about it and that's the way it's gonna go but to tell you more about the story right now uh, this is some classified shit so no one's heard this but me so I'm gonna just throw it out there so in this world we got basically three continents well let's say four continents four land masses the biggest and the main one is Ilrock and it's pronounced I apostrophe L R O K, and it's pronounced Ilrock. Okay, this is the main. This is the main place. It's got rivers. It's got mountains. It's got like a snowy part, but it's got two main cities. It's got the coastal city in the east, and then it's got like this big ass like Staten Island sort of thing going on in the west, and that's where the capital is, which is called blah 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 blah, blah the capital. I haven't come up with a name yet, but anyways, so. We're on this big island called Ilrock, and this is where I plan to have all the characters meet up. You're in the capital in Ilrock, and you'd be like, well, where did Ilrock come from? Well, back ago, before there was anything, there was just the founder. The founder was a great and powerful wizard, and he used his magic to create a thriving society of good citizens in the capital of Ilrock, he imbued his spirit into the very ground and made it bear good fruit. But the wizard was very old, so he locked himself in a castle on the outskirts of Ilrock, and he hasn't been seen since. That's just the lore I have right now. Now, let me tell you some behind the scenes shit. You just heard what the players might have heard, but here's what's really going on. So. We don't, what I plan to tell the characters is that you don't know there's other continents. You have to discover the world. And by the way, I took a lot of uh, inspiration from uh, Adventure Time. But the, the characters there, the characters, they don't know the world. So they have to go out and explore. So right now they think, oh, we're all on this like massive island called Ilrock. And there's nothing else in the world. Just the landmass. Ilrock. Maybe they don't explicitly think that, but that's all they know. They only know Ilrock, so they have to go and discover things. What they don't know is that there's three other continents out there. Um, one of them I just called the Triglycerides. Yes, I know what weird name, but whatever. I call it the Triglycerides just because that was the first thing that popped into my mind. And then the second one is like Enderger or something like that. And that's another... Uh, island. Both of these islands are to the east of Ilrock. Um, one of them's more like northeast and the other one's like southeast. Um, um, they're slightly smaller than Ilrock, but they're not tiny land masses at all. And then you, all the way in the northwest of Ilrock, past like it's Ilrock is a giant uh, island basically. So it's surrounded by water, and if you go past Ilrock to the northwest, um, over the ocean, you'll find like these t this tiny little island, um, and that's where the uh, Fallen Kingdom is going to be. And I, ha I have an idea to make it all like snowy and stuff, and um, you'll see like frozen bodies scattered around, and nothing like all of this has been preserved because of the ice. Um, and so you see like people basically how they died, you know, people slumped over with like spears sticking out of them. People that are just exploded 
and turned into like goo and then the king is like dead on the throne and he's frozen as well basically the ruins of a fallen kingdom that's gonna be over there and the lore behind that um and by the way these like fallen kingdoms exist on the other islands the lore behind why these kingdoms are fallen is remember the founder the great powerful wizard he was actually evil and he killed off those uh civilizations those cultures but some of them remain not on the fallen kingdom the fallen kingdom the island to the northwest that's the fallen kingdom that's gonna have nothing on it that's a barren wasteland of frozen tundra nothing's gonna exist there but on the other two islands the, there's still ruins of the kingdom some I'm, I'm thinking like maybe some citizens survived maybe like a race of orcs have taken over maybe no one knows maybe it's just another civilization that are like oh these something happened here but whatever i'm gonna go back to farming that's the plan that's going on right now but anyways this wizard of ease is evil why is he evil well that's where i'm having trouble because i'm trying to find uh reasons why reasons why this wizard would turn evil that's not a cliche or that hasn't been like done before i don't want it to be like oh he's just he's just doing it for money or oh he's you know i don't know like curse or something or maybe it, this is a real writing sin maybe you don't say anything at all maybe you just say he's evil <laughs> that is a writing sin i do not like that at all and this is speaking from a non-writer i do not write i do not read but that is a writing sin <laughs> and um yeah so that's basically the plan um and i was trying to figure out i asked chat gpt this i'm like huh how do I make this guy have evil intentions? How do I, you know, write a character that one, isn't a cliche and two, is original? I don't want to just copy and paste, you know, like the judge or light Yagami into the thing. Um, although that already sort of happens with like archetypes and stuff, but I digress. And uh, ChatGPD spat spat out a few interesting stuff and you'd be like oh well they could be uh paranoid or deluded into uh, you know doing the things they're doing uh they could be overly ambitious you know i want to take over the world and shit they could be desperate and they could be like this is the only way basically this is the only way that like i survive my family survives my kingdom survives they, this is the only way uh they could be psychotic and um, no, that that's that goes into the umbrella of paranoid. They could think that this is for the greater good. You know, I killed off those civilizations because they were gonna get me anyways. Um, they could. Um, what else? What's another one? Uh, money. <laughs> they could just do it for money and be like, yeah, they had money. I wanted it, so I killed them. Um, but yeah, those are some of the things that they added, and that got me to thinking. Let me see if I can add like um like a real life nar narcissist in the story. Like not like an actual person like Amber Heard. Like I'm not going to put Amber Heard in the story, but a narcissistic person and I'm going to see if I can like use narcissistic tactics on people. Be like like um and this is something I'm also kind of fascinated by is like the narcissistic tactics in stuff. Be like a uh, Stuff, you know, like gaslighting, be like, no, we didn't go to that party. We didn't go to that party. Don't you remember? We went to this party. You'd be like, oh, you didn't wear that dress. That dress is ugly. Uh, and you even said so yourself, remember? Um, you know, that's gaslighting. Uh, and I'm not qualified to talk about these at all. This is just shit I find interesting. But that's gaslighting. Um, what's another uh, tactic I remember? A diminishment, I think, is one of them. Be like, look, man, look at this thing that I found. It's so fucking cool. It's so fucking epic. It has like a, uh, what's it called? It's a little, like I, I made this awesome cake. It's fucking awesome. I spent a lot of time into it. It looks amazing. The narcissist is like, oh, well, anyone could have made that cake. You just followed instructions. You know, it's not really that impressive. You got to do something original with it. That's diminishment. Uh, what's another one? I remember love bombing, but I'm not sure how that works. And, um, you know, I'm really into, like, true crime sort of stuff. So I remember uh, watching the Jim Can't Swim video on John Copenhaver. Uh, he was famous for uh, love bombing. 
because uh, what he would do is, you know, he'd, like, beat the shit out of his, like, girlfriend. And then the next few days were, like, fucking, like, he got her snacks. They watched all their movies. He'd stay home from training just to, uh, like, spend time with her. That sort of stuff. That was love bombing. But all this to say is that I want to add, like, a narcissist in the game or something. And um, this is this is what I stole kind of from like Doug Dimadone. That's Douglas. That's the DM I'm working with. Well, I'm not really working with him, but he's the d dungeon master of the game that I'm playing right now. And um, what's it called? He says like, oh yeah, I always try to add one random encounter per like session. That way it keeps the fun alive. And I'm like, oh yeah, that sounds cool. Um, so one of the other things I want to add. Um, is I, I already told you about the narcissist. I was actually going to make them a narcissistic thief. And as, as soon as like the game gets tired of them. And starts to try to kill them. He's going to do like some Naruto hand signs. And then phase out of there. Like into a puff of smoke. And then you guys like maybe never see him again. I haven't quite sure. But one thing I do want to add to my Dungeons and Dragons world. Is a cult. I fucking love cults. They're like so cool. I use, I love cult so much that I started my own cult. It's called the cult of the God. And who is the God? Me. I'm the God. <laughs> anyways, that is a lie. I have not started a cult. Do not assassinate me, FBI. But anyways, I fucking love cults, man. There's such an interesting narrative concept. And, um, I haven't quite figured it out, but I want this cult in my Dungeons and Dragons community to be to be something based off of the coffin of Andy and Lele. By the way, that game is fucking awesome. It's one of my favorite games of all time. Um, but I can't really play it uh, when my roommate's in the room because I get embarrassed because, you know, uh, I mean, that, that shit in that... The shit in that game is... Uh, I mean, it's not bad, but... There's some awkward moments if he, like, caught me. Um, well, it's not. What am I talking about? It's, it's a fucking game, bro. You can play in front of your roommate. Um, anyways. But I want the cult in my Dungeons & Dragons world to somewhat reflect that. Um, because that is an awesome game. I loved how they did the artwork. I loved the story. Yeah, but I want to add a cult in this Dungeons & Dragons world. And... But to get back to the original lore of the story, so the founder, let's talk about the founder. Remember I introduced you to him? The founder, he started everything, he killed off all the civilization, and then he locked himself in the tower. That's who we're talking about now. So, the, what, I want the ta what I want the founder to be is he's like the final boss. And what happened is, after he locked into the tower, this is some classified shit, so you can't tell the players this, but after he locks himself into his tower, he uses his magic powers to turn himself into a lich. And for those of you who don't know what a lich is, maybe I don't either because I might not be pronouncing it right, but a lich is... I, I actually learned what a lich was through the book Ready Player One. Um, and it... It's not in the movie, it's in the book. So if you read the book, you know what a lich is. But to basically recap what it is, it's typically some, like, a king or a powerful magic deity that uh, uses its powers to reanimate its own corpse and then and infuse it with its own soul. So it's like a perverted swarm of immortality where like, yeah, you died, but then you used your magic power shit to reanimate your body. So now you're a zombie and then you transplant your soul into the zombie. So now like you're like just normal, but now you're necrotic. So that's basically what I want my, um, my like king, like the founder to be. And he's just chilling in his uh study and i have to figure out what he's doing because when's the last time you sat in a room and did nothing like honestly did nothing for more than like 30 seconds like you just sat in a chair and you just did nothing you didn't close your eyes you didn't try to sleep you didn't try to meditate you just sat there for more than 30 seconds never you never When's the last time you did that? Never. It doesn't happen. You're always fucking doing something. You're always looking at your phone. You're walking somewhere. You're fidgeting. 
but so I got to figure out what he's doing in this entire time that makes the story interesting. So that's what I want him to do. And he's going to be like the final boss. Like all my characters are going to fight him at the very end. So that's what I'm going to do with that. What's another thing that I wanted to add? Um, let's see. There's this one guy. I've been fascinated with this character design for, I think, over a year now. And it all started, I think, maybe even two years. Like, the seeds have been planted two years. Basically, I am fascinated by psychosis and schizophrenia. Like, the seeing and hearing of shit that's not there. Not deluded, not delusions, not seeing reality for what it is and then reinterpreting it into something you know, but actually seeing shit that's not there. That's what I love. And so this is a character design that I that predates, I think, even me going to college is is um so listen. This is the character design, right? So we got this guy. So, it's a guy or a girl, I haven't quite decided. I'm leaning towards guy, but maybe that's just because I'm a guy too. And be easier to like create and accurately depict. But I digress. It's this person who is schizophrenic slash psychotic. And how these hallucinations manifest is they have an imaginary friend that only they can see. This person is rational. They're not crazy. They're like a normal fucking person. But they have this imaginary friend um, that they think is... Well, I haven't quite... I'm I'm stuck between, between they think it's real and they acknowledge it's fake. Because if you have an imaginary friend, I mean, you can only get away with that for so long before your parents say, like, hey, you know that dude isn't real. And then, they're like, they slap you. <laughs> but, um... Yeah, so I haven't quite decided if they know or not, if he if they're real or not. But the point is, they have this imaginary friend that this um, imaginary friend will point out shit and will like investigate stuff and basically tell give this person a lot of knowledge and information. And he'll always the person will always attribute th this knowledge to that character be like oh um my imaginary friend told me this or uh, let's give him a name like clark so clark is the imaginary friend so the uh, guy will so he'll be sitting at a bar the psychotic guy will be sitting at a bar with his imaginary friend clark and they'll just be having a conversation and then clark will say something like that dude who just walked into the bar he has 200 gold pieces on his left pocket and uh, he'll just say that. And then it's up to the psychotic guy whether he wants to like steal it or leave it alone. Um, but um, so you'll be thinking of yourself, but how does that work? You know, how does Clark know this, but the main person can't if he's, you know, because Clark doesn't exist. He's a figment of his imagination. So how does Clark know something that the main character doesn't? Do you see how that logic works? You know, and my reasoning behind this is Clark is almost his like own entity, but the person, uh, the psychotic guy, the psychotic guy is also a hyper paranoid. He's constantly analyzing shit. He's constantly seeing stuff. He'll like, let's take that uh, gold pieces analogy. He's facing towards the door. He's facing, or no, he's facing away from the door, so he can't see the gold pieces. But he hears 200 gold pieces jangling over the sound of, like, you know, mugs clacking and people talking and uh, drinks being poured. He hears that over all of it, but he doesn't recognize the sound. And that's where Clark comes in. Clark takes that sound and it, and he analyzes it and he tells. Um, the psychotic guy, yo, the dude who just walked in the door has 200 gold pieces on his left pouch. That's how he knows it because Clark heard it through the psychotic guy. And But the psychotic guy didn't register it, but Clark did. So in a way, you could say that Clark is hyper paranoid, not the psychotic guy. But anyways, so 
this is the character design, right? So he has this imaginary friend, blah, blah, blah. And uh, he'll constantly attribute actions up to him. But basically, that's what it is. And he sees this guy. He's fucking physical, basic in his mind. Like, he sees him picking up, like, um, stones. You see him picking up glasses. It's almost like uh, Tyler Durden in a Fight Club, if you know that movie. I mean, of course you know that movie. Um, but yeah, this this uh, character design, I've just been entranced by because he just... I don't know, something about it, man. It's, like, I, I love Tyler Durden's, uh, like, that whole... I love that movie, man. That was a good movie. But, like, the way they revealed Tyler Durden uh, being part of the char- the main character, the protagonist, that was fucking cool. I was like, yes, awesome. I want more of that. So, that was my character design. I've been talking for, I think, around 30 minutes now. So I'm going to stop this, clean up everything for the next guy because I'm recording this in a sound recording studio, not in, like, my house. But anyways, that was my, uh, yeah, that was my, uh, (laughs) that was my rant about Dungeons & Dragons, I guess. So anyways, see you guys later. Bye now. (laughs)